it's crazy how much y'all have not changed. Well, I think we have. Well, I tell you, Sarah, when I look in the mirror, I don't know who's looking at me. Uh, you look the exact same as when we were children. I must have looked very old when we were children. No, but everyone looked <coughs> old to us when we were children. No, I remember you running down the street laughing. And I remember you because your hair was flying back. Long hair, long hair. So the reason I'm doing these videos at this point in time is because of Ukraine. Okay. And the preface to that being, when my grandparents, all four, came to this country, they never said a word. Nothing. And so for the first time, I think many in my generation are beginning to understand the why behind the silence. Are we on now or not? Yeah. Yes, okay. <clears throat> you know, looking back, I'm not even looking back, you say, people of your generation. When I saw the children on the Ukraine, and I saw their faces, and I saw what they were going through, it took me way back. Now, we didn't go through what they were going, what they are going through. We didn't have Germans on our borders because we had the oceans. But the fear of one day seeing someone always remained in my mind. And I've told the children this. But this time it really threw me back because they were saying these children are gonna have a lot of trauma in their lives and they will remember it and this cannot be erased. And I thought, you know something, it can't because I remember so well the bombing in London, the fact that they bombed one time 50 nights and days without a stop. We were in the cellar, we used to take shelter in the cellar, and um, it was so close. And I remember my mother standing there, we were in the cellar, and she put her arms out to Hazel and I, my sister Hazel, and she looked up and she said, dear God, take us all together and years later when I went to a psychologist because I'd lost both Joe and Ezra and I needed someone to talk to and I spoke to her and like she said you have to take, take me to your childhood and I said we really don't have enough years for me to tell you about my childhood till today she said no you must I told her about this particular incident and she said what a terrible thing for a mother to say take us all together. And I said to her, no, you're wrong. I said, my mother didn't want us to be orphans. And that was when I stopped going to her. I mean, it was just a waste, a complete waste. But this Ukraine is unbelievable. So you this were born in London? Yes, 1929. 29, and you grew up in a Jewish neighborhood? And Yes, <clears throat> well, for the first nine years of my life, we did. We didn't live in a Jewish neighborhood. When I was three, we moved to a Jewish neighborhood mm -hmm. because my parents were able to afford it then. We lived there, and when I was 10, the war started. Mm -hmm. And But up until that time, it was just a normal childhood. Little girls going to school. But one thing I do remember, Sarah, that might be interesting. In my school, now this is in 19... 35, 36, we didn't have electric light. We had gas light. Mm -hmm. And I remember the gas, the um, light man coming by the outside, right, um, lighting the lights with a long taper. And I thought, you know, I didn't realize then that we didn't have electric light in the schools. Mm. And I didn't realize that until we went back and years later. Mm. But I thought that might be interesting for the kids to know. Wow. So anyway, the war started and we were evacuated. And you were evacuated to where? 20, the farthest they could find a place to send us was 25 miles out of London, which now is central London. Of course it is. We got into a train. I remember walking to, do you want this? Yeah. Oh. I remember walking with my mother and father. It was early in the morning. 
September the 3rd, September the 3rd. We were walking up the street. We were going to my sister, Hazel, my older sister, Betty. We were going to her school because we were going to be evacuated from her school since we were a family. And I remember walking up the street. I remember it like in a little vignette, um, just my mother and father and Hazel and myself with our gas masks slung over our shoulders, not knowing where we were going or why we were going. And walking up the street, and we had just now, just at that time, got the fluorescent lights in the streets. Mm. And it was misty that day, it was horrible. It was rainy and misty and cold. And I remember going into the hall and singing, Oh God, our help, little kids. But we felt even old then. We then walked to the train station and we got in the train and my mother volunteered to be a, a helper. So she came with us. We got out of the train and they were digging trenches mm. for the people that lived there. All the people and the kids had been sent out of that city, out of that town and they were sending us there for, for um, safety which was absolutely ridiculous. <coughs> the first year of the war, excuse me, <coughs> allergies. The first year of the war, nothing happened. It's okay. Okay, let it go. Don't know that you had... It, 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 no, I was going your to turn... Your iPad was working, everything was working on this day. <laughs> True, thank God. No, we stayed there for about six months, I believe, and then we came back to London. And nothing had happened. There was no bombing or anything for the first year. And then in 1940, I believe it was May, don't remember. The funny thing is I've got a book on the Second World War, The Chronicles, and I took it out to try and compare with what was going on today. And um, they bombed the docks of London. I remember my father saying, come upstairs, it was a Saturday afternoon. He said, come upstairs because we had gone down into the shelter. Come upstairs and look at this. And we could see the Spitfires wow. flying and the horizon was blood red. And that was when they started bombing. That was the beginning of the Blitz. And it went on and on and on. And when it <clears throat> got very bad, my mother would send us to um, another place <clears throat> she had an aunt in Liverpool. We had an aunt in Liverpool. She had a sister. So she sent us to Liverpool for safety. Liverpool is a big dock. The first bombs that dropped, dropped on the dock there. So she brought us home to England. Then she sent us to Cardiff. Cardiff was a big city. The first bomb that dropped in Cardiff itself dropped across the street from my aunt. So she took us back to London. So it was back and forth. The schools were closed. And somehow or other we existed. I I really don't remember how. Mm. And so how did you come to the States? My older sister, Betty, married a GI mm. during the war. And she came to America. She was one of the first war brides to come over. She came to America and came to Houston. That's where he lived. My father had always wanted to come to America, but my mother would never leave her family. So this was a good opportunity. They had put a tremendous tax on luxury goods. And mm. my father was a, a, um, a farrier. Mm. So he decided to come to America, came to New York because he had a brother in New York and found he couldn't get a job because he wasn't an American citizen and therefore he couldn't belong to the union. So he, of course, decided to come down to Houston to see Betty. And whilst he was on the train coming down to see Betty, we didn't fly in those days, right. coming down to see Betty, Foley's opened their store on Main Street and they advertised for a furrier. Ever, you know, we couldn't imagine in this heat, but people traveled and they had a fur salon. So my father came down, he worked for them a week, which was highly illegal, and they liked him and he liked them and he came, he came back. He came back to England 
and sold the house. And then a week before we were to leave, we had our visas. Foley's um, spoke for us, said that they would, if anything happened, you know, they'd take care of us financially. And um, a week before we were to come to America, I woke up with scarlet fever. So they had to come because uh, the visas would expire and I was in the hospital and they left me in the hospital. And I was in the hospital with all little children. Everybody was little. I don't know how I got scarlet fever, why I did, but anyway, I was in isolation. I got out and then I came to America by myself. How old were you? 18. Oh, well. Oh, I had a good time. Yeah, that's, that's kind I of fun. I wrote home and told my friends I had an affair. They said, an affair? I said, yes, I kissed an American boy. That was the affair. <laughs> that's amazing. That's it, was amazing. Delight. it was delightful. So you got to Houston in the 49. 40s, late 48. Late 40s. 1948. And so it was a small Jewish community. And yes, everybody and it was, was very related. Clicky. Everybody, everybody was, was related. It was very, very difficult when we came. I bet. I bet. And Where was, was your first house? On not what, um, Third Ward. Over off Holman and. Uh, yeah, Third Ward. Yeah. It wasn't a house. We rented an apartment. Yeah, yeah. We hated it. There was no air conditioning. It was horrible. Then we moved to Wentworth, Riverside. Riverside. And that's really where I began to feel like myself. The only problem was, Sarah, when I came, I had already finished school because <clears throat> towards the end of the war, I got a scholarship to St. Martin's School oh, of wow. Art, and, uh, which is now a very prestigious school, and was then too. And I had worked for one year as a dress designer's apprentice. So I came here and all the girls were in college except for those that didn't go to college and they weren't particularly, I won't say intelligent. Intellectually stimulating. In any way. Traveled. Absolutely. Well, not even traveled. They weren't grown up. They were like children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I met Celine Gorel. She was Celine Roth at yeah. that time. We became very good friends. And uh, then I met my husband. Then I met Joe. Wow. Three years later, I married him. So, when you were in London, did you experience anti-Semitism? Oh, yes. You did. I remember in school, and I see it again as little children. We go into the Great Hall for the morning, and the, teacher, the principal would go through and tell us what was going to be happening during the week. And then she'd say, now we're going to have prayers Will all the Jews leave? And these, I can see three little girls standing up. The three of us, we were not living in a Jewish area at that time. I can see us getting up and walking out. And we had to go to a classroom where Miss Jacobs let us draw. That's all we did. So there was a lot of anti-Semitism in England. And when the war broke out, did it get worse? Or, it, I mean, did you know when the war broke out had you heard Jews were being slaughtered? No, you didn't know no. none of that news I, I, spread. I didn't, well, I don't know. Maybe my father knew, but I don't think so. And did, was all of his family in the UK? England, yes. So everybody was. Everybody. You didn't we have didn't have anybody. Anybody in Europe. over no, in Europe? No. All, all no. in the UK. Interesting. So when you moved here, my parents were born in England. Oh, okay. My grandparents came to England in 1899. From. Russia. Russia? Yeah. So, before the pogroms? Or because of the pogroms. Or because of the pogroms, right. they got out. Wow. My grandfather came first, as most, most of them yeah. did, made enough money to send for my grandmother. Okay. And she came over with one child, and a year later, my mother was born. Okay. And the rest you know nothing of? No. Yeah. Like most of us. No. My grandmother nothing. always said she was an orphan. So she didn't even know what her last name was. Wow. Yeah, the silence. So I couldn't. No, she didn't know what it was. No, but I mean, it, yes. no one talked about it. No. Uh-uh. No we, one talked about those pogroms. We didn't even. Well, we 
we didn't even, as children growing up, we didn't even think to ask our parents or our grandparents where they were from or what did they do. It wasn't like it is now. Actually, I asked my grandparents and they wouldn't talk about it. And my father tried to talk to his parents and they would not talk about it. His parents came over. Yeah. You see, mine didn't. Yeah, yours were. Mine were born in England. Right, right. So they didn't, they didn't have, that. have any persecution. Yeah, they didn't have that burden. And so when you moved here, there was no doubt in your mind you'd raise your family Jewish. I married a Jewish man, of course. <laughs> I didn't dream. Whoever, whoever thought of not marrying somebody, whoever thought of dating somebody who wasn't Jewish. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is, 2022. What are you the most proud of in your life? If you, if you have My life just your life. My life, my children, the things I have done. I've done so many things, Sarah. Um, from not being a dress designer to painting for the Houston Chronicle. I did advertising for them before they had photography on the Sunday advertisements. I painted in the shop window because the woman wanted to show off her beautiful English materials. So she asked me to sit and paint in the window design, so I did. I worked, oh Lord. Not to mention this proper British woman moved to Texas. Mm -hmm. And I became more proper as the years went on. <laughs> no, it was a wonderful life. I had a wonderful life with Joe. You know, we all lived on Glen Meadow. The kids grew up and everything was wonderful. And um, very fun, as I recall, <laughs> it was. It was marvelous. It was marvelous. And the most marvelous thing about that is the fact that you're all still together now. Amazing, right? Yes. That we all yes. ended up in Houston yes. and reconnected, mm -hmm. and I think that mm -hmm. is it's amazing. Amazing. And of Truly. course, Joe died, and uh, I started a new life. Mm -hmm. I started uh, working for K-Marvin's Photography, painting portraits and touching up for them and going to weddings and looking at the proofs that came through and all the people that would have invited me to their wedding, their daughter's wedding, I didn't because Joe wasn't here any longer. And I thought, I'm going to go to these weddings. So I became a bridal consultant. And that was another phase of my life. And the bridal consulting business you remember from me, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and you were amazing at it. I did well, I think. You did I a did. great I made, job. I made some wonderful friends and lived a very, very lovely life. And then I met Ezra too. Mm -hmm. And that was a great part of my life as well. Mm -hmm. And things have just been marvelous for me. I remember moving from Glen Meadow and saying, I don't think I'll ever find anything as beautiful as this. And I moved to uh, Post Oak Park, and it was so lovely there. When I moved from there, I thought, I'll never find anything as lovely as this. And I moved to Herman Drive, and that was marvelous. And uh, I, I made up my mind when I moved here that I was going to like it. I made up my mind when we walked in brought Janie with me. I said, this, I think this is it. She said, I think it's you, Mom. And I made up my mind that I'd start doing things with the people, and there are lovely people here. They're very, very, um, they're from all over the world. Right. We have from Dublin, we have from Australia, we have people from Singapore. So interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting, yep. interesting. And, and, still. Our, and at our age, everybody has a story. This is the marvelous thing and you listen to each other speaking, and it really is lovely. The world's not that yes. big. Yes. No, and there were some people here that I know, maybe when I moved in, and maybe you know them, I don't believe so. Do you know the Eagles? They went to Beth Yashirin and Bris Shalom. They're a couple, they live on my floor, as a matter of fact. They've been wonderful, they're up in there, way up in their 90s. Doris Cowmans, did you know Doris? All right, Doris lives here. She visited, we had dinner last night and she visited with me for a while. And um, who else is Jewish? And we have one lady from Bolivia. Mm. 
she's lovely. Her daughter lives here, and Jamie knew her. Her daughter growing up with Sarah. Mm. But, um, and another one from Mexico. Mm. There are only six of us, and every Friday we get together after dinner. Nice. We come up to somebody's apartment, we light the candles, oh, we wow. have challah, we sing the prayers. Beautiful. And it's family visit. Lovely. And it's sort of a little part of Judaism. Yeah, Suddenly we're yeah, together. you've got your own little yeah. bayat here. Your, your yeah, as we say, Shabbos bayat, it's nice. It's sort of when we walk in, and we have dinner by ourselves in the yeah. private dining room. We sort of go into our own little ghetto in the private, <laughs> by choice, though. Of course, of course. So, you know, there's a privilege, I think, and there's a downside. I think I'm learning that ageism is real, and people fail to understand the wisdom, the wisdom that comes with aging. I'm going to be 65, and I'm beginning to just get an eye view into it. Just it, things shift. And I'm curious as you have gracefully continued to learn and grow, what, what wisdom would you impart? What, what, if, you know, if I, what should people know about aging? If you're fortunate enough to be healthy, there's nothing you can't. Mm. You know, I used to um, work at a grief clinic. I think I told you, mm -hmm. at Bo's place. Mm -hmm. And we were told we mustn't do this, we mustn't do that, we can't take the people, we can't get too close to the people, etc., etc. Which is very hard when you're holding a mother's hand who has just lost a child to a murder. And one day, I took this young woman, she was impossible to stay with a group. It was a group therapy thing. And I said to her, come on out. She said, you're not supposed to. I said, I don't care, come out. And we spent the whole two hours walking and talking. And when it was over, the morning was over, I went to the person that was in charge of me, social worker. And I said to her, you're probably going to literally kick me out. She said, why? I said, I took so-and-so out and I know I'm not supposed to. I said, I know it was wrong. She said, Rita. I said, and I know I'm the oldest person here and I know you're gonna throw me out. She said, Rita, you, with, you come, with your age comes wisdom. You do the right thing. You do what your heart tells you. And um, I think that's what you have to do as you get older. You begin to not see the faults in people, you begin to see only the good things in people and the faults sort of diminish. And things that used to bother you about people don't bother you anymore, you can accept them. They can drive you crazy, but you can accept them. I think mostly you learn not to judge. You learn to try and be happy. And if you're fortunate, you can.